Okay, so this weekend we're devoting, as I said, several uh, sessions to the subject of unlimited growth, how to achieve it and how to maintain it. Now even though the subject matter will be about church organization and growth, this is not the ultimate goal of the church. Growth is a byproduct, growth is a spin-off benefit of the church's true objective. And the church's true objective is to be faithful. That's what you shoot at. You shoot at being faithful. Because when Jesus returns, He is not going to be looking for a big church. He's not going to be saying, okay, who's got more than a thousand or who's got money in the bank and who's got you know, you know, nice windows or polished, who's got a multi-purpose bill? He's not asking for that. When Jesus returns, He's looking for faithfulness. A church of 20 who are faithful. A church of old people who are faithful. A church that meets in a mud hut who are faithful. Faithful. Faithfulness is what he is looking for. And so what we work at is being faithful. Growth is a spin-off of being faithful. Jesus adds to his church as it faithfully follows his instructions for ministry and growth. And I might remind you, by the way, that in your workbook you have a study sheet on this particular topic. You don't have to fill it in, you can use it as a fan, you can do whatever you want. Some people just like to have the outline in front of them. And so if somebody asks, what is the goal or what is the mission of this particular congregation right here in Ponca City? It would not be, our goal is to be a growing church. According to our Bibles, the answer should be, our goal is to be a faithful New Testament church. That's the goal. That's what you're shooting at. That's what you're striving for. That's what you're praying for. That's what your meetings are about. Because if you strive for that, the Lord will add to your number. Okay? That's the whole seminar in a nutshell, in a sentence. If you strive to be faithful, the Lord will add to your number and continue to add to your number as long as you do that. However, there is a cost attached to everything and everything has its own particular demand. So being a faithful New Testament congregation is no exception. So this session tonight, um, uh, in this session rather, I'd like to go over some of the requirements necessary to remain and flourish as a faithful New Testament church. Because you see, it's, it's exciting to talk about growth and imagine the rewards of an unlimited potential, that's all wonderful, but the question is, are we willing to pay the price that this requires? So what does it take to be a faithful New Testament church? Well, number one, you have to know who you are. <laughs> you have to know who you are. <coughs> you see, you can't become or you can't preserve something unless you know well what that thing is. So let's begin by describing what a faithful New Testament church actually is some basic things that you are probably well aware of. Well, first of all, historically, and this is kind of some basics here, I think most of us know this, but just to make sure we've covered all the bases. Historically, we come from a restorationist movement begun in Europe and spread to the frontier of America in the 18th and 19th century. That's who we are. I mean, I'm come, I come from Canada, from Montreal, from French Canada, right? I know where I come from and I know who the people are where I come from and I never heard of the Restoration Movement until I actually became a member of the New Testament Church. 
And it was important for me to understand you know, what that was, if I'm going to serve to preserve it. Because my history is, I, listen, I'm, I'm French and I'm Italian. So if you were French and Italian living in Quebec in the 1950, 98% chance you'd be Catholic. 98%, can you imagine living in a place where there are six million people and 98% of them are Catholic? If somebody would have said to me when I was say 20 years old, that one day you're going to be a preacher for the Church of Christ, when I was 20, okay? I would have first of all not understood what he meant by preacher, that term. I, I couldn't even fathom what that term was. I grew up Catholic. I went to Catholic school. I was an altar boy. I served in seminary. I thought even about being a priest one of these days. Preacher? What is that? And Church of Christ? <laughs> what? You mean there's another church other than Catholic? So you see what I mean? If you don't know who you are, if you don't know what you're preserving, how are you going to preserve it? How are you going to be faithful? So ours, meaning the churches of Christ, ours was and is a movement to, uh, that sought to shed old world denominational traditions and religious hierarchies in favor of the simple truth, the simple faith, and the simple Christianity taught by Jesus and His apostles in the New Testament. It was the thing that appealed to me so much as a Catholic. When I became a Christian, oh man, no more bells, no more smoke. Whoa, that's awesome. You mean I can find the answer for myself? Really? When I left the Catholic Church, I mean, I actually said, okay, I'm done. You know, I'm, I'm done with this. I remember the priest saying to me, you're never going to make it without us. He said that to me, you'll never make it without us. I said, well, we'll see. And then, you know, I, 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 you know, like everybody else, I was searching, took a couple of years, reading, testing, looking. I was looking, God, I know you're out there, but I mean, who are you? Surely you're not those guys wandering around in those robes. I can't be you, Jesus, come on. And so, you know, I, you know, in my travels, too long a story, but to you know, narrow it down, I, I was with a, a group of Pentecostals. And they introduced me to the Bible. Oh, the Bible, God's word. Oh yeah, okay, I get it. And they said, okay, you're going to speak in tongues, you're going to cast out spirits. I did all that stuff, all of it, really. But I, there was one thing wrong with me. I just kept reading the Bible. And I kept reading, I said, you know, I don't see in here what you guys are doing. And they would say, well, you just don't understand. I said, well, well, the priest told me that, that I didn't understand either. That, whoa, this is sounding awfully familiar here. And I kept thinking, wow, I, I just can't see Jesus rolling around on the ground. I don't see it. I don't see Peter doing this. I don't see Paul doing this. So I said, yeah, I'm sorry. You haven't got the answers. And you know what he said to me, the, the main prophet? He said, you know what, Mazzalongo? You'll never make it without us. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I've heard that before. And it took another almost two years. And one day, I was living at my cousin's house, an old joke, eh? Living at my cousin's house, sleeping on the couch. <laughs> After having traveled for two years with my backpack and my guitar, been to Vancouver and down south and back around, back to Montreal, looking for a job, figure, man, I got to get my life together. And my cousin had a newspaper, you know, not like the big newspaper, like the Daily Oklahoma, and one of these shopper guides, they give them away at the, you know, at the grocery store. And in the middle of the newspaper, they give away free ads to churches. You know? And I was looking at the ads and one said, you know, Military Whist at St. George's you know, Presbyterian Church. Bingo at St. Mary's Catholic Church. Clothing giveaway. 
And then there was an article just one column long and it said sinners are welcomed at the Church of Christ. And I looked at that I said this guy's really saying something. That's me. That's me. And I went to this little bitty mission church, 30 people. Singing was bad when I looked back on it. The preaching was not that great. It wasn't. So I had a Bible study with the preacher and I asked him my questions. His name was Jim Metter, by the way. Still remember him. So I'd ask him a question. He said, oh, that's your question? I said, yeah. OK, wait a minute. Mark 4, 13. Read that. I'd read it. Yep. Does that answer your question? Yep. Did I just put word in your mouth? No, no, that's what it says. OK, next question. Oh, OK, Romans chapter 6. Read it. I'd read it. Is that what it says? Yeah. I'm not putting words in your mouth. No, no, that's what it says. All right, OK. That was our Bible study. That was our Bible study. No angels singing up in the sky, no visions of glory. Just one night in November, very cold night, 1977, I said to Jim, you know what? I believe I need to be baptized. All right, he said. What does it say here when somebody said they wanted to be baptized? I said, well, they said they did it right away. All right. Is that what it says? Yep. Well then, well, I guess we should do it right away. OK. And man, was it cold. <laughs> November in Montreal, no heater in the baptistry. I mean, you got to want it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you so have to want to. That's who we are. We're the Bible people. Remember that? And you know what? I'm the only one that ever answered that ad. That was, the, that was the total result of that ad. One person, one conversion. But do you know that I have preached to more than a million people in my lifetime? More than a million. That's who we are. We're the Bible people. And so the churches of Christ spread this restoration ideal throughout the world and now we have tens of thousands of congregations related only by the shared idea that we will only use God's word to establish, to build and to multiply churches as well as guiding our Christian teaching, our morals and our conduct. What does the Bible say? That's it. That's who we are. And that's a good thing. That is such a good thing. The churches of Christ are not the only ones to try to do this. You know, don't, don't kid yourself to think that we're restaurant. We're the only ones that came up with this idea. Other people have tried this and have succeeded. But I can say that we have succeeded better than anyone else at this idea of restoration. So there are restoration churches not called the churches of Christ. I've been to some of them. Never even heard of the Church of Christ, but they're doing what we're doing. The only difference is we do it better. And we've had more success in the last hundred years than the others have. So we need to remember who we are historically. That's who we are. That's a good thing. We shouldn't be ashamed of that. All right, we also have to know who we are theologically. A New Testament church is one that uses only the Bible and considers only the New Testament as the plan and guide for Christian morals, teaching and conduct. That's our theology. Our theology is not such that you have to be some sort of brainiac to understand it. Our theology is not you know, huge words and these, these esoteric concepts you know, that you, know, you, you have to have two PhDs to understand. Our theology is very simple. We are committed to doing the things that the Bible gives us to do, whether it be preaching of the gospel or worshiping God or establishing and organizing the church, whatever it is, we are committed to doing those things in the way that the Bible instructs us to do them. 
Is that like difficult to get? You know, pattern theology, is that so tough to understand? You, know, you have a pattern for something and if you make you know, according to the pattern, you can repeat that pattern a thousand, a million times, you will always get the same thing. Is it too hard to understand that the Bible is the pattern for the New Testament church and if we follow the pattern we will be able to reproduce it generation after generation after generation until Jesus returns. Is that, is that too hard to understand? But because we want to be like the smarty Alex out there in the world, you know, we confuse ourselves. And look what's happened to us. We've dealt away our uniqueness. As our brother said before, you know, uh, nobody can tell us apart from anybody else. We've given away the one thing that really separates us from other people. Now there are thousands of course of examples, but let's take baptism simply because we all understand baptism. It's a universal idea, an image in the quote world of Christians. The Bible teaches, Matthew 28, Mark 16, Acts 2, that those who can express their faith in Jesus and choose to repent of their sins need to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sin and the reception of the Holy Spirit. The grammar says that, the context says that, the history says that, the imagery says that. I mean, that's what it says. There are the candidates this is the sequence and these are the results. The candidates are believers who repent. The process is they confess Christ and are immersed in water and the results are that their sins are forgiven and they receive the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be a theologian to share that with somebody else. You don't have to defend it. You just have to proclaim it. <laughs> That's all. The God, Jesus doesn't ask us to you know, do battle with the brainiacs in the world. He just says, proclaim it. You don't have to defend the word. It'll be OK. So a New Testament church, therefore, will follow this pattern or this teaching exactly when baptizing someone and when teaching about that. New Testament churches try not to change, not to add, not to take anything away from what the New Testament teaches on a particular topic. Those that do suffer the consequences. Now this reasoning is followed for all aspects of Christian life and service and practice. We ask ourselves, how does the New Testament instruct us with this? What shall we do according to the New Testament? That's what, you know, this business, what would Jesus do? And some, some guy figured, wow, it made a million bucks, you know, selling the little bracelet. We came up with that idea. What does the New Testament say? Well, how are we going to handle this situation? I've been with our elders at meetings and you know, some situations, you know, brothers and sisters, they're tricky, you know, not exactly black and white. And I've heard this, the question said out loud, well, what would, what would the New Testament say about this? What does, the, what does the word give us? Is there a principle? Is there an idea? Is there something there that will give us some guidance? That's the right question to ask. It is this history and this theology that make us unique in the religious world and also that links us in a brotherhood of millions of other New Testament Christians around the world. So when people come here to visit, you want them to come and experience the joy and the peace and the fellowship and the spiritual rewards afforded those who follow Jesus as a New Testament church. OK, so we need to know who we are historically, theologically. And the third thing we need to know about ourselves, what is our type? What is our type and what is our character? Now, some of the things I've said so far are probably familiar to you, but I wanted to lay the basics so that we understand where I'm coming from and where I'm going. But this part here, maybe you're not so familiar with. What what is the character of the congregation? Yeah, we're all churches of Christ, Choctaw Church of Christ, Ponca Church of Christ, Edmund Church of Christ, South Africa Church, you know, all churches of Christ, but not all have the same character. My wife and I, we have four children, four children, 
coming where the bio parents of four children, we've tried to raise them exactly in the same way with the same ideas and the same attitude. And guess what? They're, none of them are the same as each other. The last one, we wonder where he came from actually. We, we're not sure, you know, we're not sure. So what is our character? Well, among the churches of Christ, we can identify several types or several character of different congregations. Okay, ready? Number one, there's the struggling mission church type. So what is this type? Well, usually about 50 members or so with a missionary who preaches and serves as the ministers, usually no elders, no deacons. And this type of congregation stays this way for a few generations until indigenous leadership can be cultivated. When I worked in Montreal, for example, this is the kind of church, it was a New Testament church, but this was the type that I was working in, a mission church. I was the only minister. You know, I can remember on a Sunday, opening the door, turning on the heat, preparing the, my wife and I, preparing the communion. People would come in, I'd lead singing, we'd serve the communion, I'd preach the sermon, people would leave, I'd shake their hands, shut everything down, take the trash to the corner, and then go home. You know, mission church, mission church type. Another type, the urban team mission church. This is a mission point church where the mission team approach has been used. In other words, several missionaries converge on a spot in order to establish a church. A good idea. Back in the day when I was serving you know, as a missionary, they would kind of drop ship you. you know, the, the elders you know, in the United States would give you some money, drop ship you somewhere you know, with a salary and just enough money for stamps to send home your report. And they'd say, OK, go ahead, plant a church. And then they wondered, why is it taking so long for this church to develop? You know? And then they, they, they decided, you know what, maybe we need a group. And so they came up with the Urban Team Mission Church. Uh, these are congregations that have reached, a, uh, excuse me, uh, this approach rather yields a much faster result in producing an indigenous, uh, indigenous local church with its own leadership. In other words, if you send in five missionaries you know, and their wives to plant a church, they're going to have a much faster result because there are five full-time workers preaching, teaching, training, and so on and so forth. So those churches, mission churches grow uh, faster and have a, a stronger local leadership. Another type of church, a covenant church. A covenant church. Covenant churches come in all sizes, big and small. They are congregations that have reached a plateau in their growth and for whatever reason they remain at a certain size and effectiveness without much change year after year after year. And so covenant churches, their commitment and their focus is to maintain a faithful presence and service to their members and to their community. Now, most churches of Christ fall in this category. Covenant churches. You know, I, I didn't say bad. You know, I didn't say bad. They're just, you know, they've, they've maxed their growth. They've reached the plateau. So they, you know, they're preaching the gospel. You know, and they're, they're doing good works, they're training people, send out missionaries, you know, but they pretty much stay at that level. Another type of um, church is a growing church. A growing church also comes in all sizes and shapes, but what is unique about them is that they consistently exceed the national average of between three and five percent in their growth rates. So a growing church is a, grow, is a church that's growing at 8% a year, 9% a year, 10% a year. That's a growing church. I, I understand the enthusiasm about a, having 100% growth. You know, that would be great. You know? But if you get 8% growth, that's something to be happy about. See, realistically, a realistic goal. Yeah, we're doing good. We grew 7.5% last year. Okay, let's keep going. 9% next year. Yeah, sure, good. Growing churches usually struggle with growth management issues. In other words, how do we minister effectively to more and more people? We're running out of parking space. We're, we, we need more uh, cradle roll classes, all these babies. And one of our problems at Choctaw is we're in the process of hiring a youth and family minister because the sweet spot in our demographics is we've got so many families with children. We, we don't know where to put all these kids. 
You know? I mean, that's a great problem to have, but it's still a problem because if we don't minister to them, we won't keep them. Okay? Another, yeah. An, well, listen, we, you know, I mean, you know, two miles that way, there's another congregation. One mile that way, there's another, you know, they're like, we're surrounded by you know, eight other churches of Christ. So, you know, uh, people go shopping, you know. All right, another type of church, a dying church, a dying church. The death of a church has a lot of causes. Population shift, for example. Uh, failure to adapt. Uh, aging without renewal. False or poorly focused teaching. Uh, poor leadership, whether it's divisive leadership or autocratic leadership or inexperienced leadership. You know, a church cannot rise above its leaders. No way. No way. Church cannot rise above its leaders. And then, of course, general sinfulness and laziness. That'll also kill a church as well. So the result is a church that's going through the motions. Many of them are rich in property value, poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. Now the death of a congregation is very sad, but sometimes it's necessary in order to re-motivate uh, people to get to renewal and to redistribute resources. When I was working in California, there was a, such a church, population shift. It was a white church, you know, white church in a certain area at one time that was very uh, well to do. And then things changed. It became an inner city. Um, a lot of uh, uh, different cultures began to move in that area. Uh, lower, uh, you know, it, was a poor, it became poorer and older. And that church, instead of adapting, instead of perhaps hiring a minister who perhaps spoke Spanish and you know, changing their programs, their approach, they didn't. They just wanted to be a white church. Well, eventually, you know, the white people died. You know? But here's what they did. Here's what they did. They were property rich. They sold everything and distributed the wealth to the various congregations in the area. You know, one to help build a multi-purpose building, another one to hire another minister. In other words, they used their wealth to serve these other congregations. So not all was, not all was lost. And then, of course, there's what I call the extreme church. I'm being polite here. Extreme churches are not known for their size or their effectiveness, but rather for their positions. Okay? Some are consistently extreme at one end of the spectrum or the other, left or right, whatever you want. It's as if they go out of their way to provoke their brethren with their position on things. And so extreme churches, their focus is more on guarding and promoting their position than actual saving of souls. Okay? And then there's the leadership church. Leadership churches are those churches which have managed to harness their growth and resources to set the pace for ministry, followed not only by their own members, but by other churches as well. In other words, they're the churches that are used as models by other churches. So it's to these churches that others come to learn how to better evangelize or how to be more effective in teaching or how to actually integrate large members of people into the uh, large number of, of uh, 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 new members, for example, into the body without losing uh, spiritual intimacy. It's where people come to experience meaningful worship and observe more effective and dynamic ways to do church work. And there are many of these leadership churches, you know, these churches that will hold a seminar on you know, early childhood education. Why? Because they have a full-time minister that does that. They have a, a track record. They have a program. They put on a Friday, Saturday thing you know, to help other churches that can't afford those things. You know, those type of congregations. Leadership churches. Now, there are two key questions for you here in this congregation that you will have to answer. Number one, what is your present type? And number two, what type do you want to become? Now, I don't know you well enough, I can guess, to answer the first question. But I do know that if you want to be a growing or a leadership type church, 
there is a second thing that you must know aside from who you are. And the second thing you must know is how, how to be a faithful New Testament church. I know what I am, what I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be a faithful New Testament church and if I do that, then the Lord will add to me. But how do I do that? Yeah, we want to restore New Testament Christianity. Yes, we want to be faithful to the restoration principle and ideals. This is all well and good. But how do we do it? How do we do this? You know, I, I know what seminars are like. I've attended a lot of them. We're all pumped. We're all, you know, yeah, we're going to do it. You know, let's, yeah. And then you walk out the door and... So how does the, you know, what we learn, how do we get it out of this, this room tonight? Well, we begin by putting aside the religious traditions that we ourselves have created and really begin to follow the New Testament pattern for church organization and function. That's where we start. And a good place to begin scraping off the barnacles of religious habit and tradition is with a careful and reflective reading of Ephesians chapter 4. Somebody says, is there going to be any Bible tonight? Yes, Ephesians chapter 4. You thought I was going to go to the book of Acts, but no. Ephesians chapter 4, that's where the New Testament church is. It's in Ephesians. So if you have your Bibles, you can do that. If you don't have your Bibles, it's okay. I'm going to throw the scriptures up here uh, on the screen and you can read them off the screen. Let me show you what I mean when I say a careful and reflective reading. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and begin reading. It says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you also were called in one, uh, in one hope of your calling. Okay. We so go to the book of Acts to look at the New Testament church. And I believe that that's part of the problem. The New Testament church is in Ephesians. That's where we start. OK, let me ask you the question. Are we conducting ourselves with humility and gentleness and forbearance? That word, by the way, forbearance, an old-fashioned word, it means to put up with other people's weaknesses patiently. Are we doing this in the church, uh, the New Testament church? Because that's what happens in the New Testament church, you see. Is loving one another despite differences of character and opinion, is it common here in this church, this New Testament church? Do we shrink our pride? Do we shrink our will? Do we shrink our ambition down to size in order to build unity? Because that's the New Testament church, my friends. Do we hold our tongues? Do we act kindly towards one another simply because it's the loving thing to do and not because people deserve it? We don't do stuff because people deserve it. We do stuff because they're our brother, they're our sister. Because if we start doing stuff because they deserve it, imagine, you think Christ did what He did for us because we deserve it? Is there a common teaching about Christ and the doctrines of Christ? Is there a common life that all share in the spirit of Christ? Are we truly in submission to the God and Father of all every day in our personal lives? Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you, a faithful New Testament church lives and breathes by these guidelines. A faithful New Testament church isn't just we have communion once on Sunday. That's not the idea of a New Testament, faithful New Testament church. That we baptize by immersion, you think that's the only thing that's important to be a New Testament church? We're not the only ones that do that. Other people do that. That we don't use instruments of music in our worship. That's correct, that's, that's biblical, we can defend that. But do you think that really is the mark of a New Testament church? Listen, Greek Orthodox, right? They don't use instruments in, the, in their worship either. You know why? 
Greek Orthodox. They can actually read the Greek. <laughs> they know what it says. No instruments. But would we, any of us here that know anything about Greek Orthodox, would we actually say they're a New Testament church, they're a Restorationist church? Because they don't use instruments either. You see what I'm trying to get at? We've described the wrong thing. We've described it just by externals. We haven't described it by the guts of the thing, the heart of the thing. That's why we don't know, that's why I'm saying we got to know what it is we want to preserve. A faithful New Testament church lives and breathes. Ephesians chapter 4. Let's keep going, shall we? He says, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when He ascended on high, He led captive a host of captives, and He gave gifts to men. Now this expression, He ascended, what does it mean except that He also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is Himself also He who ascended far above all the heavens, so that He might fill all things. And so, a New Testament church understands, as Paul explains here, that it was Jesus and only Jesus who came from heaven down to earth and then went back again. That's what he's saying here. It's a little mysterious the way he explains it, but he's simply saying only Jesus came from heaven and then only Jesus went into the ground and then only Jesus came up out of the ground and went back to heaven. Only Jesus, nobody else. And in doing this, he demonstrated his lordship over all things on earth as well as in heaven. That's the point he's making. And so what's the point about New Testament Christianity here? The church of Christ holds only Jesus as head, only Jesus as Lord of the church. Not tradition, not human intelligence, not opinion, not what's popular, but only Christ and what He has done and what He's taught. I'll give you an example. Many years ago when we lived in Montreal, my, uh, our eldest daughter, Julia, she had a best buddy, you know, they were best friend, best friends forever. You know? They went to school, they did everything together, you know, whatever, they were about 12 or so in those days. And so this little girl, her parents invited us over for coffee, you know, just to meet us, since you know, their daughter was best friends with our daughter, we were neighbors, sure, we'd go over, you know, we sit and we chit-chatted, had a nice conversation about the girl, and the girls were having fun playing dolls or whatever they did in the room. And you know, if you're a preacher, if you're a minister, you, you know what's coming. You know, you know what's coming. Because we talked about the weather and we talked about sports and we talked about hockey and we talk, we're in Canada after all, we talked about hockey and stuff. And then eventually the big question came. You know what the big question is? So what do you do, Mike? I'm a minister. Oh really? How about that? Well of course, the minute you say you're a minister, then oh boy, here we go. So then he had all kinds of questions. So I, you know, I gave him the answers you know, and so on and so forth. So then he said to me, he said, well, uh, 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 so do you, do you believe that uh, you know, um, like the Buddhists, you know, are they going to heaven? He had to do it. He couldn't hold himself back. And I said, uh, no. And his eyes got big. What do you mean? I said, well, the Bible in Acts chapter, the Bible, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, there is no name under heaven by which we can be saved. Is there another way to interpret that to include Buddhists, by the way? Can I squeeze in Hindus, Muslims, atheists? Can I squeeze them in under that scripture? I can't, can you? Well, I mean, these people were, you mean to say, only Christians are going to heaven. I, said, well, I guess only, the, only Christians who are confessing Christ, that's what it says, that's what I believe. Well, I just, I mean, he was flabbergasted. And I mean, from there on, it was just trying to figure a way to leave politely. I mean, I didn't go in to you beat him up with the scriptures. We were neighbors. We were just going to talk about you know, our daughters and school and things like that. But he wanted to know. He, you know. he wanted to get me. And in my mind, I said, you asked. You went and asked. If you didn't want to know, you shouldn't have asked me. You shouldn't have asked me. 
the church of Christ holds only Jesus as Savior. A faithful New Testament church is not ashamed of naming Christ as the Lord and the reason behind everything that is done in our personal lives and in the world. He's either Lord or He's not. If He's the Lord, then He is the Lord and we're not ashamed to acknowledge that He is the Lord. That is, if we are a New Testament church. Let's keep reading, shall we? Verse 11, and He gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So a New Testament church is organized and functions in the way the Bible says it should function and be organized. And this is the core of my teaching tomorrow. You want to grow? You have to first of all be organized the way the New Testament organizes the New Testament church. This means that apostles and prophets and evangelists and elders and teachers are valued for what they truly are. They are gifts, they are favors that God has blessed each congregation with. You know, between preachers, you know, we, we have that joke between us. There are preacher jokes. I mean, there's only two preacher jokes that exist. You know that. Eh? Either the preacher you know, can't stop preaching, he preaches too long, or he only works one day a week. Every joke has that punchline. But among ourselves, preachers, we have our own jokes you know, that we're, they don't realize that we're a gift. They don't realize that we are a gift. We may not be wrapped very well sometimes, and the bow may not be shiny, and there may not be much glitter at times, but the New Testament says that God has given gifts to the church, and those gifts are not money or real estate. Those gifts are elders and teachers and evangelists, and at one time, prophets and apostles. You can have a congregation without these people, since whenever two or more are gathered, uh, are gathered rather, Christ is present, yes. And the body of Christ is made up of saved individuals added to the church by Jesus Himself. Yes, Acts 2.47, but I'll tell you something, you rarely have a growing church or ever have a leadership church without the blessing of elders, evangelists, and teachers. I guarantee you that. I guarantee you that. There are a lot of little churches just bumping along and would give anything to have just one of those gifts. And having been an individual who worked half of my career for churches that didn't have elders, you never hear me complaining about the fact that we have elders. A New Testament church prays to be blessed with these gifts from God and when they have them, the church values and follows their leadership. A New Testament church also understands that the work of these men is to use their particular gifts in the task of helping the church to grow spiritually. Very quickly, we're almost at the end of this session here. First of all, evangelists, what is their role? They proclaim the gospel and they plant churches and they organize them according to the New Testament pattern. They develop leadership and continually encourage the church to do what is right before God. That's the job description according to the New Testament for an evangelist. An evangelist is not the guy who manages the building of the garage to put the bus in. That's like using a scalpel to make burgers. <laughs> and elders guard the church. They are guardians against false teachers and teachings. They minister to those who are weak in the spirit. They provide an example of godly living for others to follow, as well as overall leadership. When the majority of the elders' time is made up figuring out the budget, they're wasting their time. Let me put it to you this way. They're not serving according to the New Testament. And isn't that what we said at the beginning? If we are a faithful New Testament church, 
and teachers continually help the congregation in understanding and applying God's word to their lives. Many teachers don't qualify as elders. You know, some have the gift of teaching, but do not qualify as elders, but all elders need to qualify as teachers. And although not mentioned here in Ephesians, but elsewhere in 1 Timothy, deacons provide management and training of the church in the task of ministry. Did you hear what I said? Management and training. The deacons are the ones who mobilize the church for work. When we're considering a deacon, we're not saying, man, let's get Brother Joe, he's a carpenter, are you kidding me? We won't have to pay to have people come in and fix the building. And no, 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 that's not the New Testament church. That's not the New Testament church. In Acts chapter six, the deacons that were selected, right, to, to, to serve the thousands of people there for food, what do you think they did? They managed the task. They didn't do the task, they managed it. And why all of this work by all of these people? Let's get back to Ephesians 4. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ. God wants His church to think and act as a group like Jesus thought and acted as a single person. A New Testament church that is faithful faithfully represents the person of Jesus in what it says and what it does before the world. For example, a New Testament church has the compassionate eyes of Jesus. A New Testament church speaks His words. A New Testament church has a pure heart, a ready and helpful hand, a feet that are prepared to go anywhere with the good news. So, if you want to be a faithful New Testament church, this is the church that you aspire to become. Not just a church that has communion on Sunday, doesn't use an organ, has male leaders. You know what I'm, those are right, but they're the superficial things. If you make that the objective, don't ask yourself why things are dry, why we're not motivated, why we don't have the joy of the Spirit. Those things, tell me now, tell me. What joy do you have other than knowing that you've obeyed a command? Other than that, what joy does it bring you the knowledge that you're not using instruments in worship? Or that the men are the elders? Well, that's not what causes the growth. Purity, seeking after the spirit, forgiveness, compassion, humility. That's what causes growth. One last thing. One last thing you must know and do in order to become a faithful New Testament church. You have to know who you are. You have to know how to be a faithful New Testament church. And finally, each of you, every single person here has to be changed. Although the New Testament church is a corporate thing involving a group of people, God works on individuals within the group. God does not work on groups. He works on people. In other words, God doesn't work with the church as a group. He works within the group in individual hearts to affect the entire group. See what I'm saying? And so a faithful New Testament church is a church where change is taking place in the hearts of individuals. Again, let's go back to Ephesians 4. Paul says, so this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluding from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard Him and have been taught in Him, just as truth is in Jesus,
that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. I want you to note that after Paul has described the spirit and the organization of a faithful New Testament church, he goes on to demonstrate what's happening on the inside of each person's heart in order to bring this church to life. What brings the church to life is change and change within individuals. That's what, you know, people say, how come it's so dead in this church? Well, nobody's changing. It's the same old, same old. Never mind, it's the same old, same old, the routine. Nobody's changing. Nobody's come forward and says, you know what? Uh, you know, I've been a, you know, I don't know, uh, let's pick something really nasty, shall we? I, I've been uh, secretly consuming pornography for years and realize that it's just killing me spiritually. It's separating me from my, it's usually men, it's separating me from my wife. It, it, I, I, it's ruining my prayer life. I can't even look myself in the mirror. Enough already. I've had it. I, 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 I repent. If somebody goes forward in your church and says something like that, everybody goes, wow, maybe I ought to look at myself. That's what inspires the church. Humility, humility, reverence, repentance. So the road to achieving the twin goals of fidelity and growth runs through the heart of each individual member. So what have we learned? We've learned that being a faithful New Testament church is a worthy and biblical goal for this congregation, Ponca City, and this type of vision can lead to unlimited growth, which I'm going to explain tomorrow. But in order to receive this, you must A, know your history and know your theology. Knowing your past and who you are will guide your movement into the future. And my hope, my personal hope, is that you become a dynamic leadership church. You know, the revolution in this part of Oklahoma can start here. Why not? Why not? You, you've, you've got all the, the basics. Christians, you're mature, you have money in the bank, you have a property, you've got thousands of people around. Why shouldn't it start here? Why not? And you know what? When we let the opportunity go by, what does God do? Well, He give it to somebody else, that's all. You think you're the only ones He can give it to? No, He can give it to somebody else. Talk about that kind of regret. You know, looking at a church and saying, that could have been us. Secondly, you must know how to remain a faithful, uh, how to remain faithful as a New Testament church. Don't be ashamed of following the scriptures and challenging one another to become patterned after Christ, patterned after His words in the New Testament. And then finally, each of you needs to be changed. Remember, nothing changes unless a change is made and the first change begins always with me. Never mind about, well, if the elders change, I'll change. No, 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 forget that stuff. You change. You change. And saying, well, what do I change? I don't know. How about praying about that? Is that ever a prayer that we ever make? Instead of, dear God, I want to feel better. Dear God, I want more, fill in the blank, you know, more money, more this, more health. More, you know. how, about, how about this prayer? Dear God, Please reveal me to me. Please give me the strength to be able to see who and what I really am. Dear God, please change me. Change me. Show me the thing that you want me to change. Show me the, the one step that I can make because I'm pretty weak. I don't know if I'll make it. But if you just show me the first step and give me the courage even if I don't know what the second and third and tenth step is, if you show me the first one, I'll make that first one. So those of you who have come tonight, 
you know, in a way you've said, church growth is a good thing. And I love this church, and I love our brethren, and I love the Lord. And maybe I just don't know where to get a handle on this thing. Maybe this guy with a funny name has got something to say. I always say I'm a guy with a name that no one can pronounce from a place that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> but we don't let that stop us. 